The food system is out of balance. We've got to figure out a way to, to have you know, higher quality foods using less resources, period, or it's not going to work. So it's really going to take a grassroots effort, honestly. Instead of fighting the model, we're just going to have to change it. This is a 3,000 square foot aquaponics farm. We're raising fish and plants together. So the way this system works is we have three fish tanks here and all of this water from the fish tanks, gravity flows down through some filtration tanks and out to the plant culture beds here. The water kind of zigzags its way up and down to the troughs and once it gets to the far end of the trough, it flows into a sump tank and a single pump lifts that back up to the fish tank. Whew. These are all nice looking healthy one and a half to two pound hybrid striped bass here. Bringing the fish into the equation is a huge driver for us because not only uh, an additional revenue source, but it's a cheaper source of nutrients or fertilizer, if you will, than typical hydroponic uh, solutions. And agriculture in a general sense is the largest consumer of water worldwide. In the farm we have about 11,000 gallons of water in total. And that water is recirculating on a single pump over and over and over again. The metrics that are commonly out there is that in aquaponics you can use 5 to 10 percent of the water that you would otherwise use in traditional soil-based agriculture, which is one-time use. It's in the ground, it's gone. And water is, as you know, a precious resource. So we've got to figure out ways to grow more food with less water, and that's you know, really one of the most attractive elements of aquaponics. This acts literally like a giant conveyor belt. So we can pull out a raft of product here and we can harvest at waist height. And then when we transplant our little seedlings in, we just push all these rafts. The plants are floating right on the water. So we can just push the whole thing right up to the front of the, the room there and just keep going with a very steady rotation. And we start them in the nursery, which is up along the wall on the side. And then when the plants are mature enough, we'll transplant them right out into these floating raft boards here. We uh, service restaurants and markets that are all within five miles of the farm. That's an important metric for us. A lot of what we do is based upon uh, their demands, the products that they really need week in and week out. We don't sell at retail prices, it's not wholesale, it's somewhere in between. We work that out with the restaurants to make sure obviously it's mutually beneficial for both parties. All of our chefs, they want to have a personal connection with the farm uh, and they use that to their advantage in many respects too. Telling their customers uh, where their product is coming from how it's grown, you know, the benefits of aquaponics. The business model for the farm is, is really set up around, you know, plant and fish revenues and anything else that is a derivative of the farm, uh, period. So anything we do in terms of education and consulting, that's really a separate business model and we don't you know, muddy the waters with the farm because we want to prove that the farm can stand on its own, that the plants and the fish can pay the bills, right? So that this farm, we have labor, which is the, the highest expense. We have utilities. Uh, we pay rent here, of course, fish feed, plant seeds, that kind of stuff. That, that this farm can economically be self-sustaining because obviously the economics to this is a huge part of the sustainability equation. If it can't hold itself on its own, then how sustainable is that really?
The Elyria Swantia neighborhood is a textbook example of, of food and environmental injustice. There's no grocery stores within a two and a half mile radius, uh, so there's no access to healthy food, there's really no affordable food. The most polluted zip code in Colorado, it's surrounded by industry and commerce. And so from an economic standpoint, no grocery stores want to you know, set up shop here. To be able to produce food, to serve as an educational hub, to serve as a community center, it's not only for food we grow here, but for farmers in the region to be able to bring their food into here where the, the staff and volunteers of the grow house can, can distribute that uh, to the residents of the community uh, has been tremendously impactful and we want to continue to, to see this happen in food desert communities around the world. There needs to be investment in sustainable farming technologies, making land available to do larger scale aquaponics farms, serving our local markets, maybe help with water and utility costs, some of the major economic barriers, then we can really start cranking out a ton of food and keeping it in state. And by the way, it creates a lot of jobs. There's a lot of folks look at it, well, economically, it's hard to make a, an urban farm pencil out. Uh, and there's a lot of truth to that. You know, farming is risky and hard. Don't make profitability the only measuring stick of success. It's not just about the money. If you go back 60 or 70 years, you know, there was a point in time where you either grew your own food or you knew the person that grew your, your food for you. We're providing a tremendous amount of healthy, nutritious food to this, this neighborhood. And I don't know how you put a price on that.